Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome to another episode of Sira, the life of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. In this episode, in the previous episode, we looked at the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's lowest point perhaps uh, in his life as a Prophet and his life in general. Perhaps the lowest and the most difficult part of the Sira of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam looking at his life is the year of sorrow and the year in which he loses two of his biggest supporters and his greatest loved ones. Soon after, after he loses his uncle Abu Talib, who was not just a great supporter, but a person of very strategic importance. It was Abu Talib's support and his power and influence which meant that the Prophet ﷺ was generally speaking protected and respected, such that the Quraysh would try and negotiate with him rather than physically abuse him. He didn't receive the same physical abuse that his companions had received. Um, and so when Abu Talib passes away, and the mantle, the leadership of the clan goes to his other uncle, Abu Lahab. Abu Lahab, after a short discussion with the Prophet wasallam, withdraws his support and his protection for the Prophet. So now the Prophet wasallam, is vulnerable. And that protection is essential to him carrying out his duties and continuing to call people to Islam. And so although the Prophet Muhammad wasallam, hasn't yet decided to leave Mecca, and indeed, we are coming close to the, the, the time when the Prophet, peace be upon him, he does a hijrah, he migrates as well to Medina. At this point, he hasn't yet given up on Makkah. Makkah is still an option. It's still his home base. And he will not leave Makkah until he's absolutely forced, he's absolutely removed from Makkah. And so as a last resort, the Prophet wasallam decides to seek protection, uh, you know, tribal protection and support from a nearby city called Al-Ta'if, from the lead leaders of a nearby city called Al-Ta'if. On one night, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he takes his servant Zayd ibn Haritha with him, radiallahu anhu, who's a freed slave. He takes him on this journey, this night journey to Al-Ta'if. Al-Ta'if lies, uh, lies only 50 to, between 50 and 100 miles away from Mecca. And so the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, making sure that nobody knows he's making this journey, so that people don't say that he's left Mecca right now. We can completely finish him off. We can attack him. He maintains his allegiance to Mecca, but at night he sneakingly, with Zayd ibn Haritha, sneaks out under the cover of darkness and makes his trip to At-Ta'if. Let's take a step back and look at what is At-Ta'if as a city, and let's understand a little bit about the context of this city At-Ta'if. At-Ta'if is the second largest city in the Hijaz in this region of the Arabian Peninsula after Mecca. So after Mecca, the nearest city in terms of its, uh, you know, in terms of its economic value, its political standing, its size, is at Ta'if. In fact, the Quraysh, the Meccans, when the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was sent to them, one of their comments, one of their criticisms of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was when they said, and I quote the Quran, وَقَالُوا لَوْ لَا نُزِّلَ هَذَا الْقُرْآنُ عَلَىٰ رَجُلٍ مِّنَ الْقَرْيَتَيْنِ عَظِيمٌ They said, why isn't this Qur'an revealed to a man from one of the two great villages, the two great towns? The two great towns in this verse is referring to Mecca and At-Ta'if. So At-Ta'if was considered a great city similar to Mecca. And in fact, they wanted... That why wasn't the Quran sent down to somebody from Ta'if or one of the leaders of Mecca? Why was it sent down to Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam? This was one of the criticisms um, and the uh, forms of opposition that the Meccans gave to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Now, At Ta'if was very competitive with Mecca, so Mecca had the Kaaba, and people would come and do pilgrimage around this Kaaba. The central idol that was worshipped in Mecca was an idol by the name of Hubal. And at Ta'if trying to compete, their central idol was an idol named Allat. And they would actually orchestrate a pilgrimage and a big hoo-ha about this idol every year and get people to come and visit. So it was very competitive with Mecca, but it was very close to Mecca. And in fact, there was a lot of blood relations between the two cities. People in Mecca had uncles and aunts in at Ta'if and likewise vice versa. In fact, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam himself, he had family or extended family who lived or who were from At-Ta'if, the city of At-Ta'if. At-Ta'if was also well known for one particular thing, which is 
luxury and pompousness. Glitter and gold. Uh, At-Taif was known for its alcohol production, was known for fornication, for zina, uh, was known for enjoyment and luxury. The houses were bigger and more spacious. In fact, many people in Mecca owned homes or owned property in Taif that they would go and stay in the summer. So, sort of like a holiday home or a luxury home. And so Taif was very well known for its wealth, for its pomp and its glory. Keep this in mind as we journey with the Prophet The tribe that was in control of the city of Taif was a tribe named Thaqif. The Prophet Muhammad approaches the leaders of Thaqif with his, uh, you know, with his companion Zayd ibn Haritha radiyallahu anhu. And as they approach Thaqif, the three leaders of Thaqif mock, belittle and reject the Prophet wasallam straight away. And in fact, when the Prophet Muhammad goes out to the markets to even try to appeal to the public, the leaders then tell the public to attack, stone and basically throw as much punishment as they can physically on the Prophet Muhammad so the public of Ta'if is running after the Prophet Muhammad in the streets of Ta'if, pelting him with stones, throwing things at him, hurling abuse at him. And he gets so physically affected by what's happening that in the, in the narrations it's mentioned that the blood, that his sandals are soaked with blood, his own blood, because he starts bleeding and the blood reaches his sandals and his sandals are soaking, uh, are soaked with blood. When the Prophet ﷺ escapes at Ta'if and leaves these people bl- bloody, sweaty, exhausted, upset. In fact, when his wife Aisha radiallahu anha later on, many years later, asks him, O Prophet, O Muhammad وسلم, was there a more difficult day you faced than the Battle of Uhud? He says, the worst day, that the worst that I ever faced from people after Uhud was this day, the day I went to Ta'if. Kharajtu mahmuman. He said, I left Ta'if extremely upset. فَلَمْ أَسْتَفِقْ I didn't wake up or I didn't realize where I was until I reached a, a place called Qarnu Tha'ani. At this point, when the Prophet ﷺ reaches this location, Allah sends down to him the mountain, the angel of the mountains to speak to him. An angel who is in control of the mountains. And this angel says to him that, O oh Muhammad, tell me what you want to do to these people. Because I can collapse the two mountains al akhshabain on them and they will be finished as a result of the way they treated you. And here the Prophet wasallam says words that should be written in gold and hung on the tapestries of history. Our Prophet wasallam says, أَرْجُوا أَنْ يُخْرِجَ اللَّهُ مِنْ أَصْلَابِهِمْ مَنْ يَعْبُدُ اللَّهَ وَلَا يُشْرِكُ بِهِ شَيْئًا Don't do that. Because I hope that one day from their future generations, Allah will bring about people who will worship Him alone and will not associate any partners with Him. The Prophet Sallallahu mercy show, showed at this point. It, it exhibited itself. Despite being bleeding from head to toe, He showed mercy to these people because He hoped that maybe their future generations will be people of paradise, will be people of intellect and wisdom. And this is why Allah describes Him in the Quran when He says, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ And we have not sent you, O Muhammad, except as a mercy to mankind. To all humans, not just as a mercy to Muslims. Because these were disbelievers and yet he showed so much mercy to them. As the Prophet ﷺ walks away, he takes rest on a wall. He leans back and he takes a, a pause or he takes a break. Little does he know that this wall is a wall that belongs to two of his uncles, two of his, his uncles who, are actually, who actually live close to Ta'if. His two uncles, seeing what happened to him and feeling that tribal connection and that family connection to him, they get really moved and they say, let's help him out. So they send their servant boy, a man by the name of Addas. They send him with beautiful and delicious grapes to feed the Prophet ﷺ. As Addas approaches the Prophet ﷺ, and he offers him the grapes, before the Prophet eats, he says, Bismillah. And Addas questions him, what does this word mean? I've never heard this before. 
At this point in time, Addas is a Christian Iraqi. So he's not actually from Mecca, not actually from Medina, not from that region. He's from Iraq at the time, which was a, a you know a, a city or a country known for Christianity, which was the main religion at the time. So Addas comes from there. And when the Prophet وسلم, starts explaining to him what Bismillah means, and that he is a prophet, a messenger sent from Allah, just like all these other prophets. When he asks Addas, where are you from? Addas says, I am from a place known as Ninawa. And the Prophet Muhammad says, Ninawa? Isn't that the same place that Yunus, my brother Yunus alayhi salam was from? Yunus, or Jonah of the whale, as some know it today, Yunus alayhi salam was a prophet sent to a particular nation called Ninawa. And Addas becomes shocked. He says, no, none of the Arabs that I know know about Yunus and know about who he was sent to. Well, the Prophet says, of course, he's my brother. I know where he was sent to. And as he begins to talk to Addas, Addas becomes amazed and he accepts Islam. But backtracking a little bit, before the Prophet ﷺ meets Addas, meets this young Iraqi servant, he actually turns to Allah in supplication, in dua, and he asks Allah in a very powerful statement. Some scholars have disputed the authenticity of this narration, of this statement from the Prophet ﷺ. Yet other scholars such as Ibn Qayyim and Ibn Taymiyyah have mentioned this narration and so it's worth mentioning over here. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam raises his hands and he says, Allahumma ilayka ashku da'fa quwwati wa qilla tahilati wa hawani ala nas Oh Allah, I complain to you of my weakness and my inability. Anta arhamur rahimin, you are the most merciful. Wa anta rabbul mustad'afin, you are the Lord of all those who are weak. إِلَى مَنْ تَكِلُنِي Who do you leave me in, who, who do you leave me with? Who are you going to leave me in protection with? إِلَى عَدُوٍ يَتَجَهَّمُنِي يَلْقَانِي بِالْغِلْضَةِ وَالْوَجْهِ الْكَرِيهِ Are you going to leave me to an enemy who is going to treat me harshly? i.e. Ta'if, the people of Ta'if. أَمْ إِلَى صَدِيقٍ قَرِيبٍ مَلَّكْتَهُ أَمْرِي Or are you going to leave me in, in the charge of or under the protection of a close friend or a close family who you've left my affairs to him, i.e. Abu Lahab, the Prophet's uncle. In lam yakun bika ghadabun alayya fala ubali. If you are not angry with me, then I don't care. غير أن عافيتك أوسع لي Except that your afia, your care, your affection, your compassion is more expansive for me. أعوذ بنور وجهك الذي أضاءت له السماوات I seek the protection of the light of your face which has brightened up the heavens. وَأَشْرَقَتْ لَهُ الظُّلُمَاتِ And has inlit, it has, and it has lightened the darknesses. وَالصَّلُحُ عَلَيْهِ أَمْرُ الدُّنْيَا وَالْآخِرَةِ And through which all the affairs of this life and the hereafter have become rectified. أَنْ يُنْزِلَ أَوْ أَنْ يَنْزِلَ بِي غَضَبُكَ I seek refuge or your protection that your wrath or your punishment fall on me or descend upon me. أو يحل بي سخطك Or that your punishment becomes or that your punishment touches me. ولك العتبى حتى ترضى ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بك And there's none worthy, there's no might, no power except through you. The Prophet ﷺ breaks down in front of Allah with this beautiful supplication. And immediately Allah rewards him with a convert to Islam, somebody who's innocent and who believes in his message and who understands where he's coming from. What are the points of action and reflection that we can take from this lesson? The first point is that we should really understand the importance of planning. When the Prophet ﷺ takes this journey, it's a very strategic moment in which he really puts thought into, number one, which city he's going to, which is Ta'if. You know, for the number of reasons, why did he approach Ta'if, which we already discussed. Number two, when is he going to go to Ta'if? So he goes in the darkness of the night so that the people of Mecca don't think he's abandoned them. Number three, he takes somebody with him. He takes Zayd ibn Haritha with him just in case things go south and he needs support. Or he takes him with him as a companion. So the Prophet Sallallahu plans till the very last detail everything he can plan for in order to protect himself, in order to protect his community. So planning is really important. 
Taking strategic decisions is really important. Knowing when to leave, when to exit a situation, when to leave a job, when to find another spouse, when to move on from your workplace, when to switch the degree program you're in, when to change your environment, keeping tabs on the situation and planning, being aware of and changing, pivoting your plan based on what's happening, the new things that are happening, the difficult things that are happening in front of you. That's a very important part of the seerah, the life of the Prophet wasallam. When he lost his wife and he lost his uncle, his two greatest supporters, rather than wallowing in despair and being incapable of moving, he immediately he immediately switched or he immediately got up to action to protect his community and protect his mission from failing or, or from, from being blown to the side because he was vulnerable to attack at that point. The second thing that we can learn from the Prophet Sallallahu is his mercy, his compassion. That the Prophet Sallallahu despite what he faced from people, he was still merciful towards them. He was still forgiving of them. He was still optimistic and hopeful of them. And all of us can be merciful, optimistic and positive just like the Prophet Sallallahu The third action point we learn from the Prophet Sallallahu is to think about the long term. A lot of us are people who think in the short term. We plan for this week or the next week. But none of us ever think about what we want to do in five years time. What do we want to see our children as on the day we die on our deathbeds? We never plan enough in advance. When the Prophet ﷺ is approached by the angel of the mountains to destroy the city of Ta'if, he doesn't think about the short-term pleasure or the short-term comfort he's going to gain by punishing them. He thinks about the long term. Not what's going to happen in his life, but what will happen five generations down the line. You today and me today, we may not be able to start an orphanage, but we may be able to plant the idea in our child who will maybe start an orphanage, which will, will maybe succeed three centuries from now, but we will still get the reward because we planted the seed. Sometimes when it comes to big visions and amazing missions, we have to think generations down the line rather than what can we achieve in the next five years or the next 10 years. We have to think who else is going to take the baton and fulfill this vision. And we have to think long term as, as a collective, as an ummah, as well as as individuals. The Prophet ﷺ teaches us long term thinking. So sit down today with a pen and paper and think about what am I going to achieve? Who do I want to be? What do I want to learn, to understand, to give back? What do I, what do I want to leave on the day I die in this world? What is the world that I want to see on my deathbed? What do I want to see myself having contributed to it? And then break down that life goal or those life goals down into 10 year, five year, one year, one week, one day goals and begin acting on it today. Think long term, but start acting in the short term. Another important action point we take from the Prophet wasallam is that we should take our Muslim identity and our practices wherever we go. Even when the Prophet ﷺ was in an extremely vulnerable situation, sitting under the shade of a wall, bleeding and bleeding away, when someone offered him a grape, he began by saying Bismillah. He wasn't shy to say Bismillah. He hadn't forgotten Bismillah because of the pain he was experiencing. And that Bismillah, that one word, that small word that many of us belittle today was the reason somebody accepted Islam. Somebody was saved from the hellfire because of the word Bismillah. So there's two points to take away really. One is the saying of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam لَا تَحْقِرَنَّ مِنَ الْمَعْرُوفِ شَيْئًا Never belittle a good deed. Never belittle a small practice, a single word because you don't know what it could produce in terms of good. And the second is always be confident in your identity. Whether you're eating in front of a non-Muslim, whether you're in the company of, of people who are not practicing Islam or people who are not you know, Muslims at all, don't be afraid to start your food with Bismillah to eat with your right hand, to be who you are, because you never know who might see you and your principles and be guided to Islam as a result. The last point for us to reflect on is the tests that the Prophet ﷺ went through in order to spread the message of Islam, the physical brunt, the physical pain that he received. However, when his wife Aisha asks him about what was the most painful event, the most difficult thing that you faced, he doesn't go into too much detail when mentioning what happened. He informs his wife Aisha in the hadith that the people of Ta'if, when I went to them, they rejected me and then I went away and I stood by the mountains and I re refused the angel of the mountains when he asks whether he should destroy the people. This tells us that when we go through difficult incidents in life, traumatic incidents in life, pain, misery, persecution from people, 
And sometimes we go through things for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We shouldn't dwell on these things too much. We don't have to go into too much detail into talking about what happened in the past to other people. We shouldn't always victimize ourselves. Rather, we should learn to have a healthy understanding, process things that happened in the past and move on. Mention them briefly for the sake of a lesson or the sake of learning. But there's no need to, uh, you know, to seek other people's sympathy. And when the Prophet ﷺ is prompted, he's prodded to bring about a difficult incident in his past, he doesn't talk about it in too much depth. In fact, he mentions what happens after the pain that he received. And uh, this is from the wisdom of the Prophet ﷺ. And something that we can learn in terms of how to deal with painful events, painful memories, difficult incidents in the past. These are our action and reflection points. I hope all of you have benefited and we'll see you in the next episode where we will be discussing Al-Isra wal Mi'raj, the ascension, the journey of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa to the heavens. Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.